are so glad that you have chosen to be with us today. Whether you're here in person or online, we want to extend a huge welcome to you. Would you please join us this morning? Stand to your feet and let's lift up the God who is still on the throne. Got him on my knees again. Got him begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness.
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
hope is that perhaps today someone here needs to hear it.
endurance that only you can provide is what we need. So as your people, as your children, Father, Lord, we lift this song to you in hopes that you would hear and respond to the needs of your people. We lift up those in Ukraine and Russia. Your children are hurting in desperate need of you. Hear us, O oh God. Don't turn your face from us, Father. Hear our cries for you as a people, as a nation, as the world. We desperately need you. It's been a difficult week for me personally, just watching the events unfold on the TV screen around the world in the Ukraine. And just that sense of powerlessness, like what can I do? And the scripture invites us to turn our powerlessness into prayer. And I've been in Psalm 2 and 3 this week and just praying through those psalms. And I want to share with you from Psalm 3. This is how I've been praying for Ukraine. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes your deliver deliverance, and may your blessing be on your people. The Psalms are just such an honest, gut, emotional response to the pain and the injustice of our world. And there are there for us to pray and to express our heart's cry to God. I was also comforted this week because we as a church here at Highland Park are connected to a network of churches around the world and we have sister churches in Ukraine and Russia. And as a mission board, we were able to mobilize ourselves this week and we were able to send a significant offering to help in the relief 
for refugees, hundreds of thousands of refugees that are now displaced as a result of the war. And that giving comes through Faith Promise. The last couple weeks, we've been talking about missions here at Highland. We have something called Faith Promise, which is a specific offering for missions that all of which goes to support local and global missions. And because of that, we have these funds to be able to send. You are a part of that. And I just wanna say thank you that what we do here makes a difference in our own city and around the world in these very real needs, these things that are happening in current events. We at Highland Park are able to make a difference there. So I wanna say thank you. We've raised uh, in pledges nearly 400,000 out of the $425,000 goal. So praise God for that and thank you. And if you're able to join us on the journey, it's just simply about saying, God, if you'll bless it, if you'll bless me with it this year, I will give it to missions. Um, I've been encouraged to see the, the $1 and the $10 uh, pledges come in this year, uh, as well as some of the, the larger ones. But, uh, but whatever it is that God puts on your heart and you can give that, again, I just want you to know it makes a real and tangible difference in people's lives. So thanks for being here today. Uh, thanks for joining us. For those of you uh, worshiping with us online, thank you uh, for being here. Here's what's happening at Highland Park. Welcome to Highland Park Community Church. My name is Morgan and I am so excited to worship with you today. If you're a guest, we would like to extend an extra welcome to you as well. Now let's take a minute and talk a little about your next steps here at Highland. We believe that your next step should be toward community. If you're new here or you are not in a community group, your next step is to head out the center doors and take a left to visit us at the place today. Our team would love to visit with you and we have a gift that we'd love to give you. For our online community, we want to get connected with you as well. Please text the number below and someone from our team will get back to you. You know, part of being a community means serving and taking that next step is part of our faith journey. God has equipped all of us with specific gifts, which means there are so many gifted people right here in this room. So let's take that next step together and find a way to serve and impact the lives of children, students, or adults, both inside and outside of the church building. For more information on where you can serve, please visit Go Central after service today. We really do want to know what's happening in your life and how we can pray for you. Each Tuesday, our staff gathers together to pray over each and every request. Visit our website at the link below to fill out a prayer and connection card, or you can go on your app, or you can fill out the card in the seat back in front of you and drop it in the basket as you exit the sanctuary today. At HPCC, we take risks to pursue God and love like Jesus. And because of this, we are fully united in making sure that everyone in the surrounding area knows that Jesus loves them. When we each do our part to share about Jesus with others, we will make a way to have 50,000 conversations this year. Each time you have a Jesus conversation, use a new 2022 sticker to add your conversation to the wall in the atrium, and then tell us about it. We love celebrating these Jesus conversations with you. As we continue in worship, may I encourage you to offer God your tithes and offerings. You can give on our app or our website. You may also drop your tithes in one of the baskets as you exit the sanctuary today. Now join me as we hear from my friend Chantel about what God has been doing through her and her family's lives through tithing. Hi, I'm Chantel, and maybe you're sitting out there today as a young family living paycheck to paycheck or do not have an abundance to give back, and you love the idea of tithing, but you can't seem to take the leap. My husband and I have two little boys who are five and six, and we made the conscious decision last fall to begin tithing every check, no matter what. I remember writing everything down on paper, just like maybe you have, mortgage, car, school tuition, sports, all these other bills. And you're like, we can't tithe, there's nothing left. The cool part is, it doesn't have to make sense on paper and in our own understanding. See, when you tithe, you're truly living out Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't have to make sense on paper. God will provide. In 2022, we said that we would have our shovel ready for when God moves mountains. He's moved mountains for us and he wants to for you too. I know that being obedient with tithing has blessed my family. And I pray today that you can trust God with what he has given to you. 
He fed the 5,000 and he will feed you too. You just have to trust. Thank you so much, Chantel, for your heart and your transparency on what God has been doing through your lives. There are a lot of things going on here at HPCC that we would love for you to know about. So please visit the link below and sign up for our weekly newsletter so that you never miss a thing. And now join us for week one of our new sermon series, Hard Things Jesus Said. everybody. Man, so great to see you guys this morning. If you're joining us on the other side of a monitor, I want to say good morning to you. If you are a shut-in and you cannot get out of your house or for different reasons, one of them being COVID, it's not safe for you to come. Hey, I just want to say thanks for worshiping with us online. So grateful for the technology that uh, we're able to just be able to minister uh, and worship with you this morning. And if you're going to worship with us later online this week, just want to say thanks for joining us in worship. We're going to get right to this, and we're going to get there as quick as we can, but I just wanted to recap a couple things uh, just so excited about. Over the past couple weeks, uh, our family life ministry created space along with our children's ministry. They partnered together, and I think a hundred some people went out on dates, and a hundred some couples went out on dates, and they could come drop their kids off early. And I heard many, many couples say, we can't remember the last time we went out. And so to be able to have that space to date was great. And here's what I'm going to tell you, husbands. Husbands, wives, in your marriages, it's easy to drift. If you're thinking about getting married, it's easy to drift. Don't ever stop pursuing that lady's heart, okay, fellas? But uh, just super excited about that. We had this deal a couple weeks ago uh, in our special needs community where Barb Flynn and... and uh, Brenda Christensen just did a great job hosting a thing that we loved to call Night to Shine. It's with Tim Tebow. Special needs community came through and we were just able to love on these kids and to see the joy in their faces, man. It was like Jesus conversation after Jesus conversation. I think there were people there that didn't even go to our church and they're like, what is going on? And this is what's happening. And it was just really, really cool. I also want to just say thanks to every volunteer this morning. It's been a couple weeks since I've been up, so I just wanted to take time to say thanks for all of our volunteers, for those who come here early, from the greeters, to those with the coffee, to those who serve in our ministries, to those on the tech. If, if, you're, if you are personally touched, or if you're a greeter, or your family is, could you just help me publicly thank them out loud? Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Lastly, Darren touched on Ukraine, and uh, what I want to do is, I, you know, I know that you've prayed throughout the week, but here's what I want to just do is create space in our service in the quietness of our own hearts to just pray for those folks in Ukraine uh, right now. Pray for the church, and uh, here's what I want to let you know, man. When you think about the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know that the same God who's meeting us with us in this room is surrounding all those people. And let's not have it lost on us that there might be soldiers in the Russian army that know what they're doing isn't right, but they're being told, if you don't go and do this, I'm gonna kill you anyway. And let's not be so merciless that we can't put ourselves in the spot of a mom in Russia and Ukraine who is going to have a knock at their door to find out that their son or daughter has lost, lost their lives. If this isn't a worldwide display of what sin and wickedness looks like, and you know, let's not forget, we had this conversation in our home this week. What uh, Putin's doing is not okay on any level. But let's not forget for one second that God doesn't love him and that if he weren't to reverse course and repent of his sins, that God wouldn't forgive him. Could you imagine the media blitz if he came out and he said, man, I completely blew it? 
I'm sorry, I found Jesus in this whole deal. He's restored me, he's redeemed me. And those Russians, we're gonna come and we're gonna repay Ukraine 10 times the damage that we caused. I mean, you wanna talk about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And when I sit and I think about prayer, I think about lead us not into temptation for yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory forever. And to me, that is a great reminder that there is a kingdom that is not in jeopardy. That one day, no matter what continent you're on, no matter what country you're in, no matter what language you speak, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to come and he's gonna make all things new. And he'll be governed by love, Lord God. So if you will just pray quietly for just a few seconds together, we're gonna pray collectively. We've done it by ourselves, but something is a church to do. It'd be a great way to start our time together. All right, so let's just take a few seconds. grateful that we, uh, we can pray, and when we pray, God moves. But if all we did, church, was pray, I think we'd probably miss the mark a little bit. So hey, if there's a little bit of excess, there's ways to support what's going on in our city and around the world and encourage you beyond your tithe to just partner with God and what he wants to do. Those prayers are a great place to start, but let the Spirit of God move inside of your life where you actually put some muscle and uh, some muscle into, uh, into that prayer and, uh, and serve. Okay, so we're starting with the hard things that Jesus said today. Nobody likes hearing hard things. And we've all been on the receiving end of hard things. Man, I think about uh, you high schoolers. If you haven't heard it, one day you will. Or maybe you're gonna be the one that says it. Hey, it's not you, it's me. Yeah, that's not a fun one, man. It's not a fun thing, it's a hard thing. Um, I think one of the hardest things I heard in my life, the thing that I hated hearing the most, I mean, it was, it was worse than getting a spanking to me, was when my mom and my dad looked at me and they said, Mike, I'm disappointed in you. That was like capital punishment right there. You're like, no, anything but that. But you've probably been on the receiving end of that. Hey, man, I'm really disappointed in you. It hurts, right? Or maybe you've been on the, on the uh, receiving end of hearing words like, hey, why don't you come on in, sit down. I'm gonna make this quick. I wanna let you know that we're going in a different direction. And what that means is, man, we're gonna have to let you go today. You've been there for years and you've given your heart, your soul, your sweat, your tears and given a lot of yourself to that place and now all of a sudden they say, I don't want you anymore. Those are hard things. Or maybe you've, maybe you've heard, uh, been at the store and you, you go to pay for something and the lady looks back or the guy looks back at you and they don't know quite how to say this politically correct and they don't wanna embarrass you but they say, I'm, I'm sorry but it's registering insufficient funds. And there's a line of people behind you that hear that. If you've ever been in that spot, that's a hard thing to endure and it's a hard thing to hear. Maybe you've heard those words, those sayings, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. Those are hard sayings that for the average person, we've heard many of those, if not at one time or another, all of those things. And words like have these has this power to be defining moments in our lives that when we say phrases like that, it, it takes us back to that place. And not only back to that place, but the emotions come up with that. Like we can remember and, and the feelings aren't great. I have really good news for you this morning. This series, The Hard Sayings of Jesus, is not gonna be anything like that. Jesus did not say hard things to hurt us or wound us. Jesus said hard things for our benefit. There are hard things that Jesus had to communicate. There was hard truths because Jesus didn't want us to miss out on his kingdom. 
He didn't want us to miss out on the kingdom of God. And when Jesus said hard truths, when he had hard things to say, it was always couched in love. Now, don't mistake that for him being like nice. Sometimes love doesn't feel good. And he said the truth in order that we might understand the heart of God and that his words would actually produce a heart of God inside of us, the righteousness of God inside of us. I'm sure that there's those here who today who have often said or thought to yourself, I, I, man, I'm, I'm not good enough. And I'm sure that there's those in here today who have wondered, is Jesus enough? This series is gonna be great, and I'm so glad that you're here for it. And so if you wouldn't mind, please turn in your Bibles right now to Matthew chapter five, because we're gonna, we're gonna dive in, and our teaching with this series kicks off on what is famously known is probably the most famous sermon given in scripture. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that Jesus gave early on in his teaching. It is a, it is a sermon that is all about kingdom values. It is all about kingdom living. And man, if you just read that, and I would encourage you to read it, it is full of life-giving material, but it is also full of very challenging truths that are good for the soul and they're beneficial for the soul. And so I just encourage you uh, to be able to take advantage and, and look at that. So we're gonna be in Matthew chapter five today, and we're gonna start in verse 17. And so uh, let's just go ahead and let's look at these, um, let's look at this teaching that we're gonna look at together today. It says, do not think, this is Jesus talking, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Therefore, anybody who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. If, we can just, if I could just ask you to keep your Bibles open and if I could invite you, uh, man, running the, the tech force, if you could just go back to verse 17, that would be absolutely fantastic. When we look at this passage where Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law, I have not come to abolish, I've come to fulfill. There is a rumor circulating, and we don't know where the rumor circulating from, uh, where it originates, but the rumor is, is that Jesus somehow is not, he's not in favor of the law, that he hasn't come to, to proclaim the law. And this rumor is really ugly and really difficult for Jewish people to understand, and for part of this text, we're gonna have to pull ourselves out of our Western context, out of our Western way of thinking, and, and put ourselves in the, in the life and in the feet of the Jewish people. You see, long ago, thousands of years before Jesus came, God gave his servant Moses the law. And the law was how they were to live in a right relationship with God. That's called righteousness how they were supposed to live in a right way with God and one another was to obey the law. I want you to think about the 10 commandments, okay? So the 10 commandments, we're gonna pull them, up, uh, pull them up here for you just real quick and then we'll come back to this thought. The 10 commandments are, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so it all starts with God. This will be familiar uh, for many of us today. You shall not have any idols. Don't have any idols, okay? This is how they're supposed to relate to God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Remember the Sabbath. You gotta have a day of rest. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. Okay, that sounds like a good thing. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. You shall, don't give a false testimony. And don't covet. You shall not covet. This is how the children of Israel were to relate to God. They were supposed to keep this. 
And so they have been doing this for centuries. Now, I want to put us back in a Jewish mindset. There is a rumor out there that Jesus is done with the law, like he's not committed to the law, like he, he doesn't care about the law. We don't know where that comes from, but it may have come from jealousies from the Pharisees. It may have come from a misunderstanding, but it is circulated enough that Jesus says, I need to address this in the Sermon on the Mount. And so he says, do not suppose that I've come to abolish this. In fact, he goes on to say, and, and that would have, uh, he goes, I've actually come to fulfill it. This would have been so shocking to his Jewish audience because nobody in the history of the Hebrew people has ever been able to keep the law. When you look at that list of 10 commandments, all of them had failed in some, in some form or fashion, some way or another. And for Jesus to say, don't think I've come to abolish it, I've come to fulfill it. If you're Jewish and you're in the audience, and here's who Jesus is preaching to. He's preaching to the disciples. He's preaching to the masses. And within the masses, you also have religious leaders like Pharisees and teachers and experts of the law. So there's a big group of people that are there. And all of them of Hebrew descent care deeply about the law. Their, their ancestors care about the law, related to God, to the law. That's how they would get into heaven is by how well that they adhered to that thing and honored the system and uh, honored that law. And here Jesus says, uh, I'm gonna fulfill it. That would have been shocking. Think of some of the most shocking things that have ever been said to you in regards to faith or just life, and you're like, huh, that person's sure full of themselves. That's what they would have thought. It would have been absolutely, it'd been really hard, shocking. They, they would have had some real emotion about that, min, about that moment. But then Jesus says, hey, he talks about how that the law is not gonna disappear until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This would have been like a warm blanket following that statement that he'd made prior to. They'd been like, oh, okay, you're not gonna abolish the law. In fact, Jesus is saying, it'll never disappear. The law, even the tiniest stroke of a pen, is always going to matter until it has accomplished everything God wants. I think we can all agree today, Jesus is right. Is it God's will that he alone should be God and be worshiped as God? Is that still the will of God? Absolutely it is. Is it still the heart and the will of God that humanity would have no other idols before him? You bet it's still that. Is it still God's will that we would not misuse his name? You bet it's still his will. Is it still God's will that we would honor our mother and our father? You bet it's still his will. Is it still God's will that we wouldn't murder, that we wouldn't covet, we wouldn't do those things? You bet. It is still. So that is not going to disappear. They would have felt really good about Jesus' statement. Now, we're not under the law the way that they were under the law. We weren't given the law. We were Gentiles. We were given Jesus to follow. But they were given the law. And so that would have felt good to those Jewish people until he said what he said next. And what did he say next? He told them, unless you have a righteousness that is greater than the Pharisee, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Their righteousness, being sinless and blameless before God and one another, came from their ability to obey the law. And he said, unless, unless your righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It is hard for us to understand how difficult this would be for them to hear but I need us to put ourselves in their shoes. On their best days, 
they might, if we were to give them a number on a scale of 1 to 10 of how well they were, on their best days, they might be a 7.5. On their best days. On the best days, the religious leaders might get like a 9.5. They're better. This is their job. They're experts. And Jesus just told them that unless their righteousness is better than the Pharisees, you're not getting into heaven. What do these people want more than anything? They want to get into heaven. They want to get in to heaven. And Jesus said, you got to have a righteousness that is greater than how you obey this law, and it's got to be better than how the Pharisees do it in order for you to get in to heaven. These people deeply want to honor God. These people deeply want to get into heaven. They have been set apart. And I want to be fair to this teaching, and I want to be fair to, the, to, to those in attendance this day or not only here, but that we're in the attendance of Jesus teaching that day. Yes, there was a large crowd of people, but that crowd of people isn't so different from either this gathering or even our culture. And this gathering, like that gathering, and culture, like this culture, not everybody wanted to obey God. There were some people who were just like, I don't care. And there were other people that were like, well, I kind of care today a little bit, and there was like some people that like, yeah, you know, I really want to honor God. And there was people everywhere in between. And Jesus is trying to lead them to life. Jesus is not trying to hurt them. He's not trying to wound them. He's trying to produce the righteousness of God in their lives. That's what he's trying to do. He's wanting to bring about kingdom living. He says, unless you have a righteousness that is greater than that of the Pharisees, you are not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. This would have been one of the most difficult things that they'd ever heard, hardest things that they'd ever heard. Kind of like there's nothing else we can do. That's how they would have felt. They would have thought for a few minutes they, there'd been anger in there, there'd been enragement in there, there'd be just disappointment in there, there'd just be despair in that whole deal. It's a very hard teaching of Jesus because they know that they're not good enough. And now that Jesus has their attention, he wants to talk to them about what is righteousness that is greater than the Pharisees look like. Because there's people in that audience that day that were pretty good at obeying the law. And he goes on to say, and you can follow along, you can look in your Bible, Matthew chapter five, he continues in his Sermon on the Mount, but he's gonna talk about righteousness. He's gonna talk about the righteousness that is greater th of what he's, what he's talking about, or righteousness that is greater than, but first he could say some really hard things. If you were to look at Matthew chapter five, verse 21, you get things like Jesus says, well, have you heard it said long ago that you, show, you won't murder? And there's a group of people in the audience been like, man, I've never murdered anybody. I must be doing pretty good. And then he goes, but I tell you, that if you've ever had anger in your heart, you have, towards a brother or sister, you've committed murder. You ever hear the air go out of a balloon? Huh. Everybody in the crowd's guilty. And then Jesus says, hey, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Nailed it. Haven't done that one. Okay, but I tell you, if you've even looked at a woman lustfully, with lustful eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart. Huh. Air goes out of the room. They're all guilty because they're like, I followed the letter of the law. I haven't murdered. I haven't committed adultery. And Jesus is saying, it's not good enough. What he's trying to tell the people, he's not trying, this is what he's telling the people. He's telling people that your righteousness is not what saves you. It is never going to be good enough because you need something greater than your actions to save you. You need something stronger than your best efforts to save you. You need something better than just your stuff and what's inside of you 
to save you in Jesus is turning righteousness inside out. He's saying that our righteousness doesn't come from how well we behave or how nice we are, or how good they are, or how well they've been doing. He said true righteousness, sinless, blameless with God, has to come from the inside. And when he shares the letter of the law, like I told you, don't murder, but if you've had this in your heart, you're guilty. They are looking on the inside, like we should all do, and be like, oh, I don't have the stuff, Jesus I don't have anything good in me because I've had those thoughts. I've had that wickedness in my heart. When they reflect inward, they're like, there's no righteousness in me. And Jesus wants them to see that there is a greater righteousness available to them than that of their own doing or their own ability to adhere to the law. That's an incredibly hard thing to say to them, but again, Jesus isn't trying to hurt them. He's trying to love them. And he doesn't want him to miss out on the kingdom of God. And so what a courageous thing to do, to take a group of people and upend what they're thinking and believing so that they wouldn't miss out on the kingdom of God. And what a perfect message that Jesus gave some 2,000 years ago that is every bit is relevant today as it is back then. Because if you look in our own lives, if you look at our culture, if you look around the world, most people think they're doing good. At the risk of getting just a little political for a minute, how is Putin proposed to his people why he's doing this military strike. Because he's painted himself as good and the Ukrainian people is bad. It just proves my point that as a culture, as a people, we tend to think that we're good. And what Jesus would say to each and every one of us, you need a righteousness Better than your good deeds if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is still having a very hard saying. Could you imagine going up to somebody? He's having a, he's having a hard conversation with us. Could you imagine going up to somebody that is a nice person we could probably all agree with? By all standards, they're nice and saying, hey man, for all your nice deeds, not good enough to get you in. Well, who are you to tell me? I'm not, Jesus is. And he knows there's gotta be a righteousness greater than our actions because Jesus knew that the law didn't have the power to save. And Jesus knew that for all of the good deeds that they did, for as well as they could follow the law, Jesus knew it was never enough to cleanse them on the inside from their iniquities and their sins. And the message for us is just as true today. For all of your good deeds, in fact, I think God calls them filthy rags, apart from him, for all of the niceness you possess, for all of the things that you do that that are kind and great and awesome, you could talk about, man, you could, you could support what's going on. You could financially support missions. You could help down at the rescue mission. You could make sure, you could, you could say, I'm gonna make sure I am at church more often than not. You could even say, I'm gonna read my Bible every day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna memorize God's word every day. But all those deeds that you're doing can't cleanse the sin that exists with inside of us. And the kindest thing we can do is tell people that. 
Because that's the conversation Jesus is having with us. That your best efforts, my best efforts, will never be enough to cleanse the unrighteousness that lives within and it exists in our churches, it exists in our culture, it exists in our world, the same way it existed in the people who were there hearing Jesus' teachings. And there were some who were cut to the core. There were some that wrote him off as crazy, too much of a hardliner. Some that just said, I don't even care. My sense is there's probably that response and action in here. But I have good news for us. We're gonna end on a good note, on a high note. I wanna take you back to the original words that Jesus began with in verse 17. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. How is Jesus going to do something that nobody else has ever done by the Spirit of God living inside of him. By following and walking with the Spirit. Up to this point, these people were slaves to sin. Even though they, even though they had the law, all they had was the law. They're like, well, if I really want to do it, I know that this says I shouldn't do it, but I really want to do it. And if they did it, they're just slaves to the flesh. But Jesus was ushering a brand new deal that said a righteousness that comes from within, that comes through the shedding of my blood, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And the Spirit of God living inside us not only gives us the desire to obey God, but the power over sin and death to fulfill being obedient and faithful to him. And he says, you don't have it in you, but don't worry, I do. And this is how he did it. And he made a way that we can do it. And this morning, Jesus Christ is speaking to hearts of men and women and children in this room. And we've got to confront ourselves. Is our righteousness that we're saying, I'm going to be there, I'm going to get there. Is it based on what I'm doing? It'll never be enough. Or is it based on what Jesus Christ has done, which is more than enough? If you've ever wondered, I'm not enough, you're right, your best efforts aren't. But God loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, whose blood became the atonement and whose spirit made his in dwelling the hard saying of Jesus for us is that we'll never be good enough but the beautiful message of Jesus is through me I'm more than enough I would just ask you this morning as we get ready to wrap up where's your righteousness come from are you pinning hopes of eternity on for those who may say, I don't even really care. I get it. Sin's fun. Your flesh wants it. But I'll tell you, there will come a day when your heart stops beating and the breath in your lungs the way it is today won't be there. And you'll be standing before a holy God who deeply loves you. And he's not going to yell at you. He's not going to scream at you. He wouldn't tell you what a failure you are. He would just simply say, I'm sorry, you didn't want this in life. What you thought was good enough isn't. You missed out on Jesus. You don't want to stand before a loving God in that moment without him. For those of us here today, who would be like those in the crowd. Jesus, you can have me on Sunday. You can even have me a little bit on Saturday night when I'm thinking about going to church. But man, when we get to tomorrow, 
I'm going right back to the way things used to be. There's a level of righteousness that the Spirit of God needs to cultivate and grow in you. And I pray that Jesus' words would speak to your heart. Jesus loves us so much that he died for us. God rose him from the dead. And he gives us his righteousness that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We become the righteousness of Christ. Where we get to walk with God and live in his love the way that Jesus did. And we get that not only now, but we get that for an eternity. If you're not walking with Jesus, today is an opportunity for you to begin. The quietness of your own seat, repent of your sins. Call on the name of Jesus, you'll be saved. And please let us know. For the rest of us who in between or maybe have some room to grow, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for today. Thanks for a chance to worship you and to dive into your text. And thanks for saying the uh, hard thing to us so that we wouldn't miss out on kingdom living. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you need to be prayed for, want to be prayed for, Darren and I will be up here. Greg will come down here. Really, you want Greg to pray for you, man. He's such a kind guy. He's even a good hugger. But uh, man, we'd love to pray with you, for you. If you're a guest, please head out these doors and go to the place. Man, we're so glad you're here. Thanks, guys.